Dr. Elizabeth Loggerson is an Associate Clinical Professor at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the UCLA Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. She's also a licensed clinical psychologist whose name is synonymous with the Peers Clinic, which is an outpatient program that provides evidence-based social skills training to individuals with neurodevelopmental disabilities such as autism. So she's here today to speak to us on the topic of the science of social success in uh, for neurodivergent adults, um, lessons from the UCLA Peers Clinic. So please let's give a big E hand to Dr. Elizabeth Loggerson. And Dr. Loggerson, the floor or the Zoom is yours. Take it okay. away. Thank you, Alvin. Thanks for that nice introduction and a big thank you to you and to Sunway University for this nice um, warm welcome and the opportunity to share a little bit about um, the Peers Program with your, your audience. Um, so as um, you mentioned just a moment ago, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the science of, of social success for uh, neurodivergent adults. Um, and these are lessons that we've learned from the UCLA Peers Clinic. And just in thinking about um, what we'll be talking about this morning, um, I'm going to give you a, a brief background about the Peers Program, if it's unfamiliar to you, um, and then sort of give you uh, an overview of some of the strategies that we teach in peers. This will be the really fun part, right? We're going to actually get into the material and, and learn a little bit about things like friendships, um, about how to handle bullying, and also about how to handle or navigate the, the world of dating. And so I'll just give you a couple of snapshots of some of the skills that we teach in those various areas. Um, I also couldn't resist in sharing a little bit of our research with you. Um, one of the peers is really one of the only evidence-based or research supported social skills interventions for, for neurodivergent youth. And um, I just, I couldn't, you know, I'd be remiss in not sharing a little research with you. And I wanted to share some research that's really hot off the presses. Um, it compares our telehealth outcomes to in-person outcomes. And so I'll kind of wrap things up with talking about that and also um, leave you with some resources. So you'll kind of know where to go if you want to get more information. So in terms of just a little background about PEERS, PEERS is an acronym. It actually stands for the Program for the Education and Enrichment of Relational Skills. And uh, I developed the program back in 2004 at UCLA. Um, and back in 2004, there really weren't very many um, social skills interventions for adolescents on the autism spectrum. And, um, you know, this is 2004, it wasn't that long ago, but there really wasn't any place for me to refer families. And I was getting a lot of requests for um, that type of intervention for um, preteens and, and older teens. And, and I, I recognized the gap and thought, well, I wanna fill that gap, that's not okay. But I didn't wanna just fill the gap with just any program, I wanted to test it. I wanted to, to make sure that it actually worked. And so um, that started this line of research back in 2004. It was an NIH or National Institutes of Health funded um, what's called a T32 postdoctoral fellowship. They, they funded me for three years to develop and test um, peers. And initially the program started with adolescents on the autism spectrum as a parent assisted program where parents were um, simultaneously attending social coaching groups and, and learning how to, to provide coaching to their teens out in the real world. Um, and this, the focus was all about friendship skills, making and keeping friends, and also handling conflict and rejection. Um, things like bullying or arguments and disagreements. Now that program, you'll see the yellow manual here kind of up in the um, the middle of the top of the screen there, that was the very first um, publicly available published um, English manual uh, for peers. It's the parent assisted teen program, but that program then expanded to other programs. And we started to do research in the school setting and we were doing uh, teacher facilitated social skills interventions in the classroom. And that's the, the red manual that you see right here in the middle of the screen. Then we realized that a lot of the skills we were teaching to um, adolescents were very relevant to adults. Plus adults had other interests, things like dating etiquette. You know, how do you let someone know that you like them? How do you date? Um, so that led to the Peers for Young Adults program. And all of these programs, again, are, are evidence-based. We've done a lot of research around these programs to make sure that they actually work. Now, you'll probably also recognize that there's a lot of non-English language manuals on this um, screen as well. And at present, Peers is used in over 125 countries, including Malaysia. We just did a training um, for um, a group in Malaysia recently, thanks to, to Alvin's connection um, and 
and, and sort of sharing peers um, with your part of the world. Um, and we also have translated this intervention to over a dozen languages. And so we have programs for adolescents, for adults, even preschoolers, and we have a number of research programs as well that I'll be sharing um, a bit more information about later. So what makes peers unique from other social skills interventions is that it's, as I mentioned, one of the only evidence-based or research-supported social skills interventions for teens and adults um, on the autism spectrum. It also has this unique aspect that it's parent or caregiver assisted. So there's always someone that's going through the program in tandem with the, um, the adolescent, the young adult, the preschooler, whoever it might be, um, that acts as a social coach out in the real world. These are time-limited programs. They're 16 weeks in length, People come for maybe 90 minutes a week, once a week. That's not a lot of time in the grand scheme of life. So you want to involve other people that can provide that social support. Now, these programs are only appropriate for socially motivated teens and adults. What that means is that we're not going to force these social skills onto people that don't want to learn them. That's not really okay. That's, first of all, not going to work. And also, I don't even think that's ethical to do that. So these are actually people that are coming to us saying, hey, I want you to help me decode the social world, right? I want to know how to make and keep friends. I want to know how to date. I want to know how to get a job, whatever it might be, but they have to actually want this in order to learn the skills and be included in our groups. Um, this program is also unique in that it's what's called ecologically valid. So that's a technical term for basically just saying we're teaching what socially successful people naturally do. And when I say socially successful, maybe it's people who have friends. What do they do to, to, to make friends or to keep friends? People who are able to successfully date. What are they doing? Um, people who are employed successfully. What are they doing? Let's teach those skills. And that's what's called ecologically valid. So we don't just rely on ourselves to know what works and what doesn't, right? You could have good social skills. That doesn't mean you know how to teach good social skills, right? Some of that comes a little bit more automatic for some people. So we have to look at the research and figure out what is it that people are doing? Decode that, create rules and steps around that. And then we teach that. Um, and then another just unique aspect of our program is that we're one of the very, very few cross-culturally validated programs, meaning that we've um, done research around the globe on this program in different cultures. We've culturally modified and adapted our curricula and tested it to make sure that it works. And so all of these manuals that you see, and there's, there's others as well that I, I don't have room for on the screen here, they've all been tested through, um, through research. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, I've mentioned research a lot. These are some of the, the papers that have been published within the United States. You should just know that there's over 40 um, peer-reviewed scientific papers that demonstrate the effectiveness and the efficacy of peers, both in the United States and also outside of the United States. And um, I don't have time to get into all of the, the studies that, um, that we've conducted, but you can take a look at our peers um, clinic website at UCLA. If you want to have access to any of these papers, they're all on our website. We're trying to be very transparent about what our outcomes look like. Um, in terms of, though, um, some of the skills that we teach, I wanted to take some time to talk about that. So um, I'm, I'm really in this talk, I'm tar targeting more the adolescent and the young adult program. We also have other programs for preschoolers. We have employment programs, but um, related to friendships and romantic relationships, we teach skills like, you know, finding and choosing appropriate friends or, or um, romantic partners. Um, and that's really more for our adult program. Um, we talk about things like conversational skills, um, starting and entering conversations, exiting conversations. We'll talk about electronic communication, appropriate use of humor, um, things like good sportsmanship and, and how to organize and have successful get togethers with friends, right? That's how we develop close, meaningful friendships with people. Related to dating etiquette in our young adult program, we also teach skills like how do you let someone know that you like them? You know, how do you flirt with someone? How do you ask someone on a date? Um, and just kind of general dating do's and don'ts. So those are all sort of the friendship, romantic relationship skills, but we also teach skills related to managing conflict and rejection. So this would include for dating etiquette, things like, you know, accepting rejection if somebody doesn't want to go out with us or, or maybe politely turning somebody down, um, handling unwanted dating pressure. Um, it could also include things like handling arguments and disagreements, you know, changing a, a bad reputation, and also handling all the different forms of bullying. And so the research tells us that there's essentially four different types of bullying. 
So there's verbal bullying, which is like teasing and name calling. There's physical bullying, which is what it kind of sounds like, right? It's more aggressive and, but it could also be pulling practical jokes on someone or, or pranking somebody, maybe stealing from someone. And those are very direct forms of bullying. They're happening right directly in front of you. But then there's also indirect forms of bullying, right? And that would include things like um, cyber bullying, right? And also rumors and gossip. Now, these are four very different types of behaviors, right? So we're going to have completely different strategies for how to manage those types of bullying behaviors. So I said I wanted to give you a little snapshot um, in this lecture about some of the skills that we teach. And I'm going to start with talking a little bit about friendships. And, you know, when it comes to friendships, there's many, many different skills that we would need to learn. But one of them just sort of relates to meeting new people. Right. So imagine it's your first day at a new school or a new job. You don't really know anybody. You know, what are you supposed to do? And I'm actually going to put Alvin on the spot for a second. I'm going to ask you this question. You, you probably know the answer. But, you know, what do you think that most young people are told to do in these situations? And I should, by the way, mention to everybody here that really well-intentioned adults give really bad advice when it comes to social skills Some, sometimes because I'm like, this is one of those examples where they kind of give not the best advice so alvin you know imagine this this is a, a young person they're going to you know a new school for the first time they don't know anybody what are they told to go up and do um say hello hi mm -hmm. introduce themselves um yep. and um be curious about your friends um Oh, well, not friend yet, but uh, be curious about the other person they would like to make friends with. Um, yeah. Yeah, and see what happens. Yeah. So that's that's basically the kind of advice that most young people get. And I ask every group of kids and adults that I work with that same question. I just asked Alvin, what are you told to do? And, you know, invariably they say that they're told to go up and say hi and go up and introduce themselves. Right. Or they'll sometimes be told, like, be yourself or talk to them or, you know, but not really given, you know, strategies beyond that. Well, think about that. I mean, what would that actually look like? Like, imagine I'm there with you at Sunway University or having like an in-person sort of thing. And I walk up to a group of you and I just say, hi, I'm Liz. Right. Just sort of randomly. I mean, you know, I'm this, okay, maybe I'm the speaker there. I might be able to get away with that, but most people are not getting away with that. That is, you know, what would you think of me if I just did that in, in some random context? You'd think I was weird, right? You'd think that was an odd thing to do. You might be nice enough to talk to me because you're a nice person, but you'd probably think I'm sort of strange. That's not actually what people do in reality. And so we're gonna teach what people actually do in reality. Remember it's called the ecological valid skill. But instead, before we do that, we also have to show what not to do in these social situations. And so, you know, a lot of people that struggle socially, they'll make, you know, mistakes in these situations. And there's, there's different types of mistakes that people might make. So when it comes to social skills training, we've discovered we meet, we meet kind of two different people in, in social skills groups. You meet those that are peer rejected or those that are socially neglected. And very quickly, the difference is those who are peer rejected tend to be doing things that other people don't like. Right. And they're they're actively seeking out their peers, but they're getting pushed away in some way. They're getting rejected. So they might barge into conversations. They might be off topic. They might talk about the same thing over and over, but they're doing something other people don't like. They're getting pushed away. They're being rejected. Now, the other group of people that we often see in social skills training are more the socially neglected. Right. Now, they're often seen as very shy or timid kind of like withdrawn, and they often go unnoticed by other people. So you have to think about, well, what would be the two different social errors for those two different types of people, right? So what do you think that the, the socially neglected person might do? The one who's timid or shy? Well, they probably won't do anything, right? They probably won't engage in conversations with other people. They might want other people to come over to them, but then they might not be very inviting in their body language. Like they might be looking at their, their feet or at the ground and not being, you know, really engaging other people. So that's like the socially neglected person. What about the peer rejected person? The one who's a little bit more impulsive? Well, they're probably going to try to engage people by, by joining conversations, but they might do it in an intrusive way, 
right? They might barge in, they might be off topic. They might not even notice that the group doesn't like, isn't receiving them or accepting them. And that's what we're going to see in this role play demonstration now. So one of the things we do a lot of in peers is we do a lot of role play demonstrations of both appropriate and inappropriate social behavior. We usually start with the inappropriate example first to demonstrate what not to do. So I would start this role play by saying, you're going to see this person, Alina, come into the screen in just a moment and um, watch to see what Alina does wrong in entering this group conversation. Hey, Jordan, you'll never guess. I saw Gabe at my favorite sushi restaurant this weekend. No way. What restaurant was it? Um, just the one right around the corner. Oh, I've been meaning to try that place. Yeah. yeah, it's so close by. I felt bad that I'd never gone, but I went and it was so good. Nice. What did you guys get? I got the spicy tuna with crispy rice. Mm, yeah. yeah, it looked awesome. Have you guys just... ever been roller skating? Sorry, um, I just got the regular salmon. There's roll. this new skate park that just opened up. I'm, it's I'm really sorry. fun. What did you get? Um, just the salmon roll. It was oh, plain. They have so a Thursday good. night student night. A lot of people go to it. I don't mean to go there. I really yeah. wanted to try it out. It's really, yeah. really fun. There's also this other place by the beach that I've been roller skating. I'm sorry, what? What would you get if you went? It's really cool. I, it's like right by the water and lots of people go. All right. So we would show that role play. Then we would time out. We'd ask what Alina did wrong for entering that conversation. I'm sure you all noticed, right? She just kind of barged in and she was off topic. Right. They were, what were they talking about? They were talking about some sushi restaurant. What was she talking about? Roller skating, right? There's no context for talking about that. So now we have to do what's called perspective taking, right? So there's a technical term. It's called social cognition. It's sort of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and anticipating how they might think or feel or react in a given situation. We call it perspective taking. And so we'd ask these perspective taking questions. What was that like for the group? Well, it was probably kind of annoying, right? Kind of frustrating, like, you know, um, maybe a little confusing too. Like, who is this person talking about roller skating? All right. What did they think of Alina? Well, she's kind of annoying, maybe kind of weird, you know, um, sort of awkward. And would they want to talk to her again? Probably not. We're not off to a good start here. This is not actually how people meet new people successfully anyway. This is a definitely a social error we want to avoid. So instead, what we want to do is teach, well, what do socially successful people do to enter conversations? If someone were to enter a conversation and they were to be accepted, what steps would they be following? Well, many of you might do this naturally. You maybe just never thought about it. So one thing is that you begin by listening to the conversation, right? You got to listen, figure out what they're talking about. Um, you're kind of doing that watching from a distance, but you don't want to be staring at the group, right? Alvin, that would be kind of creepy to be staring at the group, you know? So we could do this thing where we kind of use a prop, right? So you might use like your phone or something, look like you're looking at like a text message or something. Could be like a gaming device. Could be some reading material, but you know, the prop needs to sort of make sense, right? But you're trying to look like you're distracted by something. Um, in reality, what you're doing is you're eavesdropping, right? You're listening to them, but you don't want to look like you're eavesdropping. So you're trying to identify the topic and you probably should know something about the topic. You know, you could join a conversation where you don't know anything about the topic, but you're probably going to slow that conversation down. And it might be kind of boring for them and boring for you. So you really need to find some sort of common interest. And one of the things we talk a lot about in peers is that friendships are based on common interests, right? These are the things you're talking about with your friends. These are the things that you're doing with your friends. And so we're always sort of looking for common interests in conversations. This is like one of the keys to having a good conversation. So that's what we're going to try to find here is find a conversation where you know something about that topic. And let's say we find that common interest. You're not going to just yell from across the room, right? You're going to move a little bit closer, not too close. What do we think is an appropriate distance to stand from someone, Alvin? What do you, what do you think is the appropriate distance? On two meters, I think. At yeah. an extra meter for, you know, to prevent COVID, that kind of thing. <laughs> Exactly. We used to say it was an arm's length away, but with COVID it might be a little bit longer now. You've got to change that rule a little bit. But yeah, you don't want to get too close. Um, also don't want to be too far away. Um, and then you don't want to interrupt the conversation. So what do you do? You wait 
for a little pause in the conversation, right? There's never a perfect pause, but you're just waiting when one person maybe stops talking another person is about to talk. You kind of enter at that point. And then you enter by mentioning the topic, right? And you can do that in one of three ways. You could either make a comment, you could ask a question, or you could give a compliment. So for example, in that last conversation, the group was talking about the sushi restaurant that they'd been to. So what would be a comment? You could say, oh, I've been to that sushi place. That's just a comment, right? You could ask a question. Oh, are you talking about that sushi place around the corner? That's a question, right? Or you could give a compliment. Oh, I love that place, right? But you're on topic. That's the key, right? So then what you're going to do is after you've sort of tried to join, you need to start assessing the group's interest pretty quickly. And you can tell pretty quickly if you're accepted into a conversation. But what's funny is if you ask most people how they can tell if they're accepted or not accepted in a conversation, most people will say that it's a feeling that you get. But in reality, if you're getting that feeling, you're picking up on concrete behaviors that give you the feeling, right? So what would they be doing with their eyes if they want to talk to you? They'd be looking at you, right? And not rolling their eyes or making a face. What would they be doing with their body? They would be facing you, right? Not turned away, giving you the cold shoulder. And they would actually be talking to you, right? And not giving rude remarks or short, you know, comments. These are the three behavioral signs that tell us if we're accepted or not accepted. We also describe this too in a different way. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but when people talk in groups, they sort of talk in, in a circle, right? So what do they do? Alvin, what do they do with that circle? when they want to talk to you? Well, kind of like open up and get mm -hmm. curious, I guess. Yeah, they open the circle, exactly. And what do they do if they don't want to talk to you? They close that circle, right? They give you that cold shoulder. So we talk about opening the circle and all these things are good signs. So then if things are going well and you've never met them before, after you've been talking for a little while, then you can introduce yourself. Right. And it's optional. You don't have to. But if there are going to be introductions, they come later. They don't usually come at the beginning. All right. So now what we have to do, if we're teaching this as a skill, we've done the bad sort of inappropriate example. Um, we did some perspective taking on that. We went over these ecologically valid you know, steps for joining a conversation. So the next step in our formula for teaching this, of course, is to show the appropriate example. And so I would say, watch this role play and think about what Alina is doing right this time and entering this group conversation. So Jordan, you'll never guess, I saw Gabe at my favorite sushi restaurant this weekend. Nice, what restaurant was it? Um, just the one right around the corner. Oh, I've been meaning to check that place out. Yeah, it's so close by and I've never gone, but I went and it was really good. Cool, what did you guys get? I got a spicy tuna roll and I loved it. Yeah. You got the spicy tuna roll? That's what I always get. Yeah, how good is it? It's so good there. Have you guys tried the rainbow roll there? I haven't. No, I actually got the salmon roll. Oh, okay. That's good too. But yeah. the rainbow rolls is their specialty. That's cool. right. Yeah. If you were going to go, what'd you get? I love the California roll. It's my favorite. Mm -hmm. I've tried that one there, actually. It's really good. Oh, nice. nice. All right, so then we time out. We ask what Alina did right, and we would go through the steps again. We call that repetition of instruction, right? She'd kind of go through all the steps she just followed. And then perspective taking again, right? What was that like for the group this time? It was nice, right? It was normal. And what do they think of Alina? She seemed friendly. She seemed nice. Would they want to talk to her again? Probably. This is how we meet new people. Right? We don't go up and just say hi and introduce ourselves. That's not really how it works. It's more of just entering conversations, maybe starting individual conversations. We'll te we teach other strategies as well, but that's sort of the main way that people meet new people. So that's related to friendships. I also wanted to give you a little snapshot of some of the skills that we teach related to bullying. And in particular, I wanted to focus on handling teasing because it's such a common form of bullying really across the globe. It's really, really common, unfortunately. So this is another example of where really well-intentioned adults will sometimes give really bad advice about what to do in response to teasing. So Alvin, I'm going to put you on the spot again. No worries. What do you, what do you think that most kids are told to do in response to teasing? Ignore, walk away. Um, those are toxic stuff. You got to go make nicer friends. Yes, or tell someone. Yeah. Mm. 
Exactly. That's what they're told to do. And I hear the same responses every time I ask this question across the globe, kids will say, and adults, they'll say that they're told to ignore, just like Alvin said, walk away or tell an adult, tell somebody, right? Then I ask them if it works. What do you think they say? Um, not really. They still get teased. <laughs> yeah. And bullied. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, they they often continue to get bullied. So the reason that they probably continue to get bullied is that those are not ecologically valid. That's not actually what socially successful people do to to minimize or to stop teasing, right? Um, And the reality everyone should know is that everybody gets teased. It doesn't matter how popular you are, how many friends you have, like everybody gets teased. It's how you react to it that determines how significantly, how chronically, how severely you're teased. And so we want to kind of dispel that little myth, first of all, that those strategies don't really work. I should probably walk that, walk through you, um, or sorry, walk you through the, the reasons why those don't work. So imagine, for example, that someone is teasing me and I ignore them. What are they going to do? Well, they're going to keep teasing me. And I didn't do anything, right? So I kind of look weak and I made it easy for them. So I'm more likely to be teased. Now, if I walk away, what are they going to do? They're going to follow me, right? And keep teasing me. And I, again, I didn't do anything. I was kind of looked weak and they, it's easy now. I'm just making it too easy for them. They're going to keep teasing me. And if I go tell somebody now, they're going to want to retaliate against me because I tried to get them in trouble. Those are not ecologically valid. So we don't want to be teaching that. And honestly, it's, if you've ever told kids to do this, don't feel bad. Everybody tells kids to do that. You know, it's like a, it's like a, a a global epidemic of bad social advice. (laughs) Like it just, it just is what it is. So instead, you know, we've done research to figure out, well, what do socially successful kids do to stop the teasing? It's actually very simple. It's probably the easiest skill we teach in peers. What these kids do, these adults do, is they'll give a short comeback that shows that what the person said didn't really bother them. And actually what they said was kind of stupid. It wasn't funny. And so they'll say, it's very short, and they'll say things, at least in the, in the English language in the U.S., because there's cultural differences, they'll say things like, you know, whatever, or yeah, and, or am I supposed to care? Is that supposed to be funny? You know, so what? Big deal. Who cares? You know, tell me when you get to the funny part. They'll roll their eyes, they'll shrug their shoulders, and they give the impression it doesn't bother them. And, you know, this is obviously culturally different based on where you live and what language you speak, right? But there's almost always a direct translation for things like big deal, so what, you know, who cares, yeah, and am I supposed to care? Like this is almost always directly translated. And this is actually the same skill that's used just in different parts of the world. And the only difference really seems to be like the linguistic part of it, the words that are used. But the idea that you act like what the person said didn't bother you, that's key really across the globe from what we've been finding in our research. So you have a couple of these comebacks and then you don't have to stand there and take it, right? You can eventually walk away, but you never walk away until you've actually shown that what the person said didn't bother you and was kind of stupid. So now I want to show you what this is supposed to look like. So we don't show an inappropriate example here. The reason is if we showed an inappropriate example where someone was getting upset or mad or teasing back, which is exactly what that that teaser wants you to do. Um, that could be very emotionally triggering, you know, for the people in our groups and stuff. So we only show the good example in this case. Um, and I would introduce this by saying, okay, in a moment, you're going to see someone named Gabe on the screen. I want you to think about what Gabe is doing right here in handling this teasing. Hey, do reading again? Whatever. You're such a loser. You're always reading. Am I supposed to care? Um, yeah, because everyone thinks you're a loser. Anyway. All right, so we would time out. We'd ask, what did Gabe do wrong there? Or sorry, sorry, what did he do right? All right, so he acted like what this person said didn't bother him, right? He was just sort of like kind of more indifferent than anything. And then he sort of walked away after giving a couple comebacks. So what was that like for the other person? Not very gratifying, right? Not what he expected. Um, what did he think of Gabe? Wasn't really bothered, right? Would he want to tease him again? 
I mean, probably not, you know, not unless um, he was used to getting a different type of reaction. There's something that's called an extinction burst. It's a technical term, but it basically means that the teasing may get worse before it gets better. Now, it's usually pretty short lived, but what might happen is imagine um, that the, the teaser is used to getting Gabe upset and mad. And, you know, that was fun for the teaser. And then all of a sudden, Gabe is saying things like, whatever, am I supposed to care? And the teaser is thinking, no, that's not how this works. And they may try a little bit harder at first, but if you stick with these comebacks, it's a little embarrassing for the other person who, the person who's trying to tease you, they will give up pretty quickly. It's very, very short lived that, that extinction burst as we call it. Um, all right, so that's the strategy that we teach for teasing. There's a lot more to it, but that's kind of the snapshot version of, of what we teach. I also wanted to give you a little snapshot of some of the skills that we teach in dating. So, you know, how do you, for example, ask someone on a date? Like if you're not doing online dating and you're meeting people in real life, like how would you ask someone on a date? Well, there's definitely a right and a wrong way of doing this. And as you probably won't be surprised to hear, we start with the inappropriate example first to show what not to do. And so um, I would introduce this role play by saying, watch this role play and think about what Gabe is doing wrong in asking Alina on a date. Hi, do you want to go on a date with me? Uh, no. Come on, just one date. It'll be really fun. No, I'm good. But I'm a really nice guy. Can we just go on one date? No, thank you. I'm okay. Come on. All right. So we would time out. We'd say, what did Gabe do wrong there? Well, he was like trying to pressure her to go out with him. He's like asking for explanations and, you know, like this is, this is not the way to get a date. So we have to do a little perspective taking. What was that like for Alina in that situation? It was probably really awkward, right? Very uncomfortable. And what did she think of Gabe? really pushy, right? Maybe a little desperate. He's trying way too hard. And would she want to talk to him again or go on a date with him? No, probably not. This is, this is not how it works, right? So even if she liked him, that was such an awkward way of asking her out. She probably would want to say no, right? So this is not how you ask him on a date. Instead, we want to teach what socially successful people are naturally doing when they're asking people on dates and, and actually having people say, yes, this is what we want to teach. And there's very concrete steps that people follow. So the first step for asking someone a date is you have to wait for an appropriate time. All right. So what would be an appropriate time? Well, preferably when there's not other people around, like, can you have an audience, right? Um, preferably when they're um, not busy, you know, in a hurry to get, you know, go somewhere when they're not in a bad mood, you know, um, these are, you know, things that you have to think about in, in advance. Also, when they're not dating anybody, you're gonna have to figure out, you know, in advance, are they dating anyone? Are they available? Um, we have a whole series of kind of signs of, you know, assessing their, the person's romantic interest, but let's assume that maybe they had been showing some interest. Um, second step is that we have to tr do what we call trade information. So trade information is a term that we use. It's a buzzword for having a good reciprocal two-way conversation. And there's just, you know, dozens of rules related to trading information, things that relate to body boundaries and, and voice volume and, um, you know, not hogging the conversation or asking too many questions. And there's lots of rules about that. Um, but we'll have to do this idea of like kind of a reciprocal conversation back and forth. And, you know, before you ask this person out, you should have probably thought about like what your dating activity options were. And, and a lot of times we recommend that people um, when they're asking someone out, they ask them to do something very specific. You don't just say, will you go on a date with me? Um, or will you go out with me? You usually have an idea of something that you could do. And usually that activity that you're going to do is based on some common interest, right? So maybe um, you both like a certain type of movie, like a sci-fi movie, and there's some sci-fi movie coming out this weekend, that could be a great excuse to ask them out. Um, maybe you both like uh, sushi, right? We were talking about sushi, right? Maybe there's a great sushi place that just opened up, but you're using some sort of a, an excuse or like what we call a cover story. So you want to work that kind of cover story um, into the conversation, right? So you're going to mention these common interests related to the sci-fi movie or for, you know, the sushi restaurant, whatever it is. Um, and rather than just sort of saying, um, well, let's go to see that movie 
or let's go get sushi together. You do this really clever thing. So let's say you ask about the sci-fi movie. Did you hear about that sci-fi movie that's coming out this weekend? And they'll say, yeah, I did hear about that. You say, well, what are you doing this weekend? All right. So this is where you're asking what they're doing at a certain time, kind of casually, right? What are you doing this weekend? Or well, what are you up to this week? Now you're doing that because you're giving yourself the opportunity to assess how they react to that. They know where you're going with this, right? When you say, well, what are you up to this weekend? They know you're about to ask them to do this thing. So now you get to assess their reaction. And if they say things like, oh, I'm not doing anything, like they seem interested, that's a great sign. You can proceed, right? Or even if they sound a little disappointed, like, oh, I'm busy this weekend. That's also still a good sign because they were sort of disappointed. Now, if they say something like, oh, I'm kind of busy this weekend, that is not a good sign, right? Alvin, is that a bad sign if they say, oh, I'm kind of busy this weekend? Yeah, it's kind of like, mm, okay, did you say it because you want to just get rid of me? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So should we continue or should we abort the mission at this point? What do you think? I think abort. Just said, okay. Yeah. Fine. Thanks for letting me know. Um, yeah. Ciao. Right. So we definitely don't want to continue to ask them out at this point. If they're like, oh, I'm kind of busy this weekend. That's it's saved face though. We didn't actually ask them on a date. And that's the beauty of following these steps. This is what people kind of naturally do. So let's assume that they are interested in this situation. So then what you're going to do is you're going to use that common interest as a cover story or a reason for going out. We should go see that movie, or maybe we should go check out that sushi place together, right? And then of course, if they say yes, then you would um, exchange contact information if you don't already have their number. Um, and then you'll tell them when you're going to follow up. So even if you had their number or you just got their number, you'd say, okay, well, I'll text you tomorrow. We'll figure out the details. You don't figure out all the details right then and there. All right, so now we want to show what this should look like. So I would introduce this by saying, watch this role play and think about what Gabe is doing right this time in asking Alina on a date. Hey, Alina, how are you? Hey, Gabe, I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. What'd you do this weekend? I just went to see a movie with some friends. Oh, was it a sci-fi movie? I remember you telling me you really like sci-fi movies. Yes, it was a sci-fi movie. Did you hear about that new one coming out this weekend? Of course, I totally want to see that. Me too. It sounds like it's going to be really, really good. Yeah, that's what I heard. Well, what are you up to this weekend? Um, nothing. Would you maybe want to go see the movie with me? Yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. Well, can I get your contact information so we can plan it out? Sure, of course. It's 555-1313. All right, great. I'll give you a text this weekend. We'll okay. plan it out. That sounds great. Awesome. Okay, so then we time out, we'd say, you know, which steps did Gabe follow there, we would go through the steps again, and then perspective taking what was that like for Alina, it was flattering right it was nice. Um, what did she think of Gabe, I mean, he obviously likes her right he was you know asked her on a date, and would she want to talk to him again go on the date? of course, like this is a great start. All right, so that's a little snapshot of some of the skills that we teach in peers. Um, as you can imagine, it's a very fun intervention. It's very interactive. Um, we not only do um, you know these lessons with the role play demonstrations, but of course the next step would be to practice the skills, right? So we practice them in the group. Um, we would practice things like entering conversations, right? Or handling teasing or even um, dating, right? We have them practice asking one of our coaches on a date. So all of these things have to be practiced. It's called a behavioral rehearsal. And then of course, there's also homework assignments to practice these skills outside of the group. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Peers is one of the few research supported programs. Um, and I, you know, again, I don't have a lot of time to share a lot of the research with you, but I did promise that I would share some research that's hot off the presses. I know Alvin hasn't even seen this yet. Um, I know you're a lot of very familiar with our research, but this is new. This is just in the process of, of being published at the moment. And what we did was we were looking at um, a comparison of our in-person um, adolescent groups, our parent-assisted adolescent groups, to um, compare to our telehealth delivery. So, like many people, you know, when COVID nineteen, um, you know, happened back in in March of twenty twenty for us in the U.S., we had to very quick quickly pivot to providing all of our interventions online. And so we were very fortunate to be able to do that pretty, pretty instantaneously because we had a lot of materials that were already created in PowerPoint slides and we could you know, kind of pivot in that way. Um, but we also decided that we wanted to collect data 
on the outcomes because it's not just enough to provide the intervention, right? We need to make sure it's working. And so this is what that study is, is doing. It's looking at a comparison between our in-person and our telehealth delivery um, groups. The measures that we use to assess outcome here included the social responsiveness scale, which is an autism screening tool developed by John Constantino at WashU. Um, we use the test of adolescent social skills knowledge, which is a um, criterion-based measure, it takes two items um, derived from each of the lessons, and it just basically confirms whether they were learning the skills that we were teaching them. The social skills improvement system is a standardized assessment of, of social functioning um, developed by Gresham and Elliott. And then there's the quality of socialization questionnaire, which is a measure of social engagement. It looks at the frequency of get-togethers in the previous month. So in terms of just how these two groups were different, um, in-person versus telehealth, um, both of the groups were 16 weeks in length. They were 90-minute um, group sessions, but the difference was that the in-person groups were obviously held in person. The telehealth groups were um, delivered over Zoom in a, in a secured um, Zoom room. The content was also the same across the groups. However, we also did add some modified rules and steps for online social skills for the telehealth groups. A lot of kids during COVID were having online get-togethers with their friends. They were going to online meetups. They were having to join conversations online. And so we had to add some new strategies for those online social skills. Now, we also do role plays in both in-person and telehealth groups, but the role plays um, for our in-person groups are live. We actually do them, kind of act them out right there in the group live. For telehealth, we were using the video role plays. Um, for behavior rehearsals, that's the practice part for the, the teens in this case. We would do that live for our in-person groups in small groups. For telehealth, we did that in live, but in virtual breakout rooms with just a few or a couple um, group members and, and a coach, a behavioral coach. And then the homework assignments were the same. The only thing that was different in telehealth was that we added what was called an in-group get-together. And that was because a lot of the skills that we were teaching, you know, many of our, our teens at the beginning, at least of COVID, they weren't very socially engaged. There weren't a lot of you know, extracurricular activities online that were social in nature for kids. And so they didn't have a lot of access to peers. And so we started to um, add an additional uh, assignment to have an in-group get together where we assigned two group members to, to practice their skills, you know, like on a, a on like a, a FaceTime call or on a Zoom call or something like that. Um, so that's how the, the groups were different. Um, the first thing we wanted to look at in terms of the, the analyses was we wanted to just look at the telehealth efficacy. Was it working? Just looking at telehealth alone. And so um, the left shows the pre-test on the social responsiveness scale. The right is our post-test. And remember that the social responsiveness scale is an autism screening tool. So you want the symptoms to go down, kind of related to social responsiveness. And you can see that when our teens joined our program, they were in kind of the upper range of the kind of moderate um, autism symptoms and um, related to social responsiveness. And when they left, they were kind of in the upper part of the mild sort of symptoms. And this is about a full standard deviation change. I should mention, if you know anything about this measure and, and um, psychometrics and things like that, this scale uses what are called T-scores. And so they have a mean or an average of 50 and a standard deviation of 10, meaning 10 points is pretty significant. And that's what we typically see in, in our in-person groups. And what we also saw here was almost a T 10 um, point difference from pre to post test um, on this measure. We also looked at social skills knowledge on the test of adolescent social skills knowledge, and you can see that the group definitely significantly improved in their knowledge of social skills related to make and keep friends. Um, we looked at the social skills improvement system. This is using standard scores that have a mean or an average of 100, a standard deviation of 15, meaning 15 points above or below that average is pretty significant. And notice that when our teens came into the program, they were sort of in the below average range of social skills. And when they left their program, we were kind of in the average range of social skills. And they saw about a 10 point standard score improvement in just those brief 16 weeks. That's not just statistically significant, right? That's clinically meaningful. If you look at the problem behaviors of that same measure, you also saw a nice decrease in problem behaviors across the telehealth group from pre to post test. 
And then finally, um, this is looking at social engagement, the number of get togethers in the previous month. And this is according to teen reports. They started when they came into our program on average, having about maybe two, maybe two and a half get togethers per month. When they left their program, they were having about eight get togethers per month. Now, some of those get togethers would have also been with group members, because remember that we allowed um, that in group get together. So maybe half of those, maybe four at most of those get togethers were people that were in our program, but the other half were actually people that were unaffiliated with our program. And then parents also saw the sort of the same rate of improvement in terms of number of get togethers that their teens were having. They went from about two to parents were saying maybe about seven get togethers per month. All right, the next question we have, of course, is, well, what do these telehealth outcomes look like in comparison to in-person delivery? And so the blue line here are, um, is the telehealth group. The yellow line is the in-person group. And this is the change in um, social responsiveness from pre to post-test. Now, remember that these are um, skills related to you know, autism symptoms, related to social responsiveness. You want the scores to go down and both are going down and at the same rate. There's no significant difference between those two groups. So they're very, very much um, in line with one another. Um, also looking at social skills knowledge, look at that. There's actually two lines on that screen. You can barely see um, the blue under there, but there are two lines. They're so similar. You can absolutely learn the skills um, at the same rate for telehealth as you do in person. No significant differences there. This is looking at improvements in overall social skills. And again, really, really similar outcomes across these groups. No significant differences. Same thing with problem behaviors when you compare the two groups in person versus telehealth. And then finally, we see social engagement. So the differences between in-person and tele, there's no significant differences between these groups. The um, telehealth groups have slightly more get-togethers, but remember some of those are with um, group members from peers, right? Normally we don't allow fraternization um, among group members in our in-person group during the group. We want them to practice with people unaffiliated with our program. So that's that kind of accounts for a little bit higher numbers in the telehealth group, both according to teen report, and then here you see the parent report. So really what this research is telling us is that telehealth delivery seems to be as effective as in-person delivery. And I find that very exciting. Um, Alvin, don't, would you agree? I mean, we've really learned a lot um, yeah. over these last two years that telehealth can be quite effective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is very exciting. I feel like I want to just join you and, um, you know, start this research over here straight away. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, um, it's it's one of those silver linings. We were talking about that earlier about how, you know, COVID has been really difficult for a lot of people for so many reasons. Um, and then there's just occasionally these little silver linings of like, well, we did learn something. Um, in these two years that we can actually maybe even reach more people with telehealth. What about people who lived in remote areas who couldn't make it to Sunway University or to UCLA or wherever to get these services? Well, now we know that actually telehealth can be quite effective, assuming that people have the right technology to utilize it. So I'm just going to wrap us up with just some resources for all of you. I wanted to also share with you a couple of research studies that we're doing at UCLA so you know kind of what's coming down um, the pike in terms of new interventions. So we have a, a program called Peers for Careers, and it's what it sounds like, right? It's a college to career transition program for um, neurodivergent adults. It's a 20-week program, and it's teaching the soft skills related to finding obtaining and maintaining employment. So, you know, things like interviewing skills and resume making, as well as like choosing a career, right? Um, also things related to, you know, conflict management in the workplace or um, requesting accommodation needs, um, even workplace bullying and, and stress management. So it's a 20 week course um, and we are in our final cohort of this particular study. Um, we're hoping to do a second randomized control trial this winter. And so far, everything's been offered over Zoom. This study started at the beginning of COVID. And I'd have to say of all of the groups that we run, this one feels like it fits the best even on, um, on Zoom. I might keep it there for a while because we can reach so many people 
with that telehealth delivery. But at any rate, um, this is very excited about this, this study. We also have um, another randomized control trial called Peers for Dating. Again, this sounds like what it is. It's a program focused on teaching dating etiquette um, for, again, young um, neurodivergent uh, adults. And it's focused on developing and maintaining romantic relationships. It's a 16 week program, um, meets once a week. And what's different about this program and our careers program is that unlike our adolescent and our young adult programs where we have parents or caregivers involved in treatment, we actually have dating coaches in Peers for Dating and also career coaches in Peers for Careers. And these are undergraduate and graduate students that are interested in working with neurodivergent adults and teaching them you know, skills related to dating and employment. But the coaches are learning probably just as much as, as our young adult participants you know, about this, but they're just providing that additional support sort of out in the real world. All right, so in terms of one last study I wanted to share with you, we also have a study looking at the combination of peers for adolescents and peers for young adults in combination with the drug L-DOPA. So if you know anything about the drug L-DOPA, it's used for Parkinson's patients. And what it does is it increases the amount of dopamine in the brain. And so if you know anything about dopamine, dopamine is like a brain chemical, a neurochemical that um, is very much related to feelings of reward and pleasure. It's like the feel good kind of brain chemical. And the idea here is, well, what if we, you know, increase the amount of dopamine in the brain? Could we make socialization more rewarding? And so that's something that we're also looking at as is also a randomized control trial. Um, so that's some of the research that we're currently doing at UCLA. We also always have a number of clinical services to just give you a little snapshot. We have adolescent telehealth groups. Those are soon to be in person again um, this fall, fingers crossed. Um, we also have young adult telehealth groups. These are both 16 weeks in length. They include some kind of parent or, or caregiver participation. Um, those will also hopefully be in person again um, starting in the fall. Um, Peers for Preschoolers is a program for kids four to six years of age. It's also parent assisted. Now, during COVID, we were not able to continue to, to run groups with children because you know, try to get a four to six year old to pay attention on Zoom. <laughs> like That's not gonna happen. So instead, it was a parent-only group, and we are literally writing up the, the results as, as I speak, um, and I've been really surprised pleasantly to find that even as a parent-only group on telehealth, that this is still a quite effective program. Um, I think parents are really the active ingredient in this particular program anyway. So we found new creative ways for parents to teach their kids about these skills. We have video puppet shows that they watch with their kids related to the skills that we teach. Um, each week, the parents provide coaching to their kids around the skills. They send us videos of them coaching their kids on the skills, and then we provide um, feedback about their coaching, and we kind of individualize it for each family, and it's been really um, amazing. So I have a feeling we will probably continue to do some version of this parent-only group in the future as well online. I just don't think telehealth is, is going anywhere. I think we'll do a combination of both. Now, in terms of other resources, those are some clinical services, some research programs. We also, um, because COVID um, made us realize that telehealth was so effective, we have decided to create um, and have created educational classes that are available to participants across the globe. And so this is run more like a class. You don't go through your managed healthcare or anything like that. It's really more like a class. Um, and they're both for teens and for young adults. And it's not just for neurodivergent teens and adults. It's for anybody who's struggling socially. We have people with you know, anxiety, depression, um, ADHD, people with no diagnoses at all. They're just kind of struggling socially and they want some skills. So this program is open again um, to participants worldwide. It's focused on making and keeping friends. We also have a five-week dating boot camp that's also available to participants across the globe. Um, it's only for peers alumni, so they will have had to have gone through our friendship program first because a lot of the skills, you know, for dating, you need, you know, you need to know how to be a friend before you can be more than a friend. So a lot of this conversational skills and things that applies to dating. Um, additionally, we also have in-person boot camps at UCLA, and these are actually coming back in person this summer, starting in June. We'll have one boot camp per month, and they're topical boot camps. Um, we have a conversation boot camp, a friendship boot camp, 
a bully proofing boot camp, a dating boot camp, and also an online dating boot camp. And these um, boot camps meet on a Saturday and a Sunday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And we just intensively focus on this one area for those two days. And it's really a lot of fun. Um, these are really magical weekends. And, and we started to collect data on this prior to COVID. So we'll continue to do that when we, we resurrect this program um, later this summer. Now, because we know that not everybody can come to UCLA for a boot camp, I've also developed a virtual boot camp. This is um, includes 35 episodes of all of the skills that we teach in both our adolescent program and our young adult program. So skills related to friendships, dating, handling conflict, rejection, bullying. Um, and you can kind of go at your own pace, basically. It's available on a, a YouTube channel that never expires. And so that's kind of a nice resource for families. Um, additionally, those role play videos that I just showed you a moment ago, we actually have over a hundred role play videos like that, and they're all available um, free of charge um, on the UCLA Peers Clinic website. If you want to use this QR code to visit um, those role plays, um, we have a full video library of all of those role play um, videos that focus on a lot of the skills that we teach in peers. We also have an app. I don't know that Alvin even knows about this. This is so new. Uh, um, we have a peers app. It's developed um, for both iOS and Android phones. Um, it's free, so anybody can access it for no charge. And it kind of operates a little bit like a video game. You see there's these different levels that you go through, and each level represents a different set of skills and peers. It starts with conversational skills and then electronic communication and kind of move up the ladder all the way up to dating, if that's of interest. Every level has a little quiz with a couple of questions and also a little homework assignment if you want to practice the skills. But there's also these embedded role play videos that are in each of these levels. And so it's a nice tool really for um, either learning the skills that we teach in peers or maybe even better, just being kind of a, a, a way of um, providing maintenance, rem reminding yourself what the skills are, you know, maybe even acting as a virtual coach in the real world. You know that prop that we were talking about for entering a group conversation? How cool if your prop could also be a virtual coach and you could be looking at the steps for how to enter a conversation as you're actually doing this. I mean, so it's a, a different way of, of again, um, learning the skills or, or remembering the skills. All right, we also have a book called The Science of Making Friends, and this was written for families that maybe can't access a peers program in their community, but want to learn the skills that we teach related to making and keeping friends and handling conflict and rejection. There's parent sections that kind of have narrative lessons with social coaching tips, but there's also chapter summaries for teens and young adults and even exercises where you can practice the skills. And there's a companion DVD as well. Um, finally, I just want to give a plug to this show. Um, I don't know if you've seen this or this is available in Malaysia. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. We have got Netflix and yeah, we, we have this. I just haven't watched it yet. <laughs> okay. So Love in the Spectrum is a show. Um, it was based out of Australia initially, um, and it's got a couple of, of seasons already. But if you're interested in learning more about um, our dating curriculum, um, season one uh, features a dating boot camp that I did in Sydney, Australia with the cast. Um, of Love and the Spectrum. And, um, you know, it's just a very sweet series. It's very well done. It's very heartwarming. Um, highly recommend it. But again, um, a nice resource if you want to learn more about our dating boot camps. And then finally, just as we kind of wrap up here, I just wanted to share with you um, a calendar of training events coming up. So I know that we have some professionals um, and educators on um, this Zoom call. And so we want to let you know that we do um, teleconferences for professionals and educators um, that really get you certification in peers. And I you know Alvin's done the certified training before. I've, I've done one of these trainings in Malaysia before, but we also offer them at UCLA as well. It's a different time zone, but um, these are some of the upcoming training dates. One of them started today, so probably won't be able to go to that one, but we have another for our teen parent assisted program um, coming up in November. We have our school-based certified training seminar actually coming up this June. Um, June 15th through the 17th. And we also have a young adult 
certified training seminar coming up this September, the 21st to the 23rd. We offer these trainings five times a year. They're year round, they're ongoing, and we offer them outside of UCLA as well. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and just sort of wrap things up. And I want to also just take a moment to thank this amazing team that we have at UCLA, a lot of really dedicated research assistants, um, administrative support team, great collaborators, generous funders. You know, it takes a lot of work to do this, this type of, um, you know, research. And I'm just very grateful to work with this very talented team. Um, finally, this is our contact information. If you want more information about peers, if you're looking for any of these resources, we also have a pretty strong uh, social media presence on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you want to follow us and get more resources. But with that, I will, um, I will stop sharing my screen. I'll thank you for your attention, and I'll open it up to Alvin to see if we have any questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Logerson. Please. <laughs> I'm just totally wowed. I mean, since the last time we met uh, 12 years ago, I mean, you've done so much. There's a lot of writing. Well done. Thank you. Really, I'm just totally blown away. So um, I also noticed that you use a typical Hollywood phone number in there, 555, followed by some numbers. <laughs> yes, there's a fake number. That's right. And by the way, I can't believe we met 12 years ago. How is that even possible? Time flies, yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, let's open up to questions before you need to run off for dinner. Um, right. Um, yes, folks, any questions for Dr. Logerson? Please feel free to unmute your mic or you may type in the chat like what uh, Nasrin just did. Uh, okay. Where's my chat? <laughs> I cannot find my chat. <laughs> right. All right. So Nasrin's asked here, yeah, those role play videos look like an excellent resource. Can we see the website address again? Um, all right. Well, Nasrin, if you just um, Google peers, or maybe even Google Dr. Logerson, you'll get, oh, there you go, ta-da. <laughs> uh, even Kaman has, has uh, put it on. Thanks, Kaman. Kaman's a former student who is now a clinical psychologist. Very nice, um, yeah, thank you for putting in the link. And um, yeah, it, and you know, Alvin's right, if you just even Google UCLA peers, it'll pop up pretty quickly on Google. Okay. Right, inspiring talk. Can I ask a question? Yeah, Chengyi, yeah. please do. Um, hi, Elizabeth. Thank you again for your very generous sharing. Um, I just want to ask um, some of the videos, um, I guess, yeah, the videos have been very helpful, but I did wonder if um, some of us here uh, did make our own videos, uh, perhaps to be more culturally uh, appropriate. Um, would that still be counted as peers? <laughs> would you, yeah, how would you view that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question, first of all. Um, and I would, I would love that if you did that, um, particularly if you were willing to share them with others. <laughs> I mean, if you were to do that and you wanted to share, we would put them on our website and um, really try to disseminate. We like to share things and make them free as much as possible because that just helps more people. Um, but either way, you're more than welcome to do that. And in fact, what we typically recommend, um, because it, it, there's, it's time intensive, right, to, to create videos and edit them and all that. A lot of people just do live role plays. That's what we do in person. Um, you could do that over Zoom as well. It's just that we happen to have role play videos when, when COVID happened. And we were like, how fantastic. We'll just use those. But you don't need to have videos. You could also do role plays live, but they should be culturally appropriate and adapted. And so I really encourage you to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? I think everyone is just wowed by your presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, amazing resources. Well oh, done to your team. Yeah, they're busy all the time. It's mm. been a lot. Of, it's fun work, though. It's it's very rewarding. It looks like maybe Eric just um, is about to maybe unmute himself. No. Maybe not. <laughs> you know, I, I also would welcome if anybody um, wants to send any questions to our clinic directly at any point. Um, they can contact us at peersclinic at ucla.edu. I'll put it in the, the chat. Um, and, you know, we're always, we have a whole army of friendly research assistants ready to answer questions at any, at any time. Um, so I hope that would be helpful as well. 
Yeah, that would be wonderful. I mean, that is wonderful. Um, yes, anyone? Questions, please. This is a very rare event. It's not easy to get Dr. Logerson. Um, and it's free. <laughs> hi. Uh, hi, Dr. thank Suwan. you, Dr. Logerson yes. and Alvin. Thanks for uh, having this talk. I'm really inspired. And I wanted to ask, um, have you ever deal with, uh, a I mean, during this session, there are so many uh, sessions and training. With, have you ever had participants actually break down? And because there may be triggers out of their, you know, past events. You know, how do you deal with them? If there, if there was a breakout, breakdown, sorry. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I didn't mention, but this is a good opportunity um, based on your, your excellent question, is to point out that PEERS is not a modular program where you just kind of pick and choose what you're going to do from week to week. We really recommend that it be kind of a lockstep program because each skill builds upon the previous skill. And so in this sort of lockstep program, the sessions that are more emotionally charged like handling teasing and bullying and all that conflict, those are all at the end of the program. And a lot of people will ask, well, why do you save it for the end? You know, teasing is such a you know huge problem for a lot of our kids. Why not start with that? The reason we don't start with that is it's too emotionally charged and it's not a safe, protected environment yet. You know, by the time we get to teasing in week 10, this is a safe environment. This is a cohesive group. They trust us. They trust each other. They've been having some success in the program. They're feeling more competent, more confident, and they can kind of go there a little bit more. But even having said that, every session that we focus on bullying, I always start with the caveat. We're not going to talk about the specific ways that we've been bullied or teased. We know it's awful to be bullied and teased. Instead, we're going to focus on what we can do in those situations to make it less likely that we're bullied or teased. And then you sort of see this collective sigh of relief, like we're not going there. It's not storytelling time. And I learned this the hard way. And Alvin will tell you, he hears me say that a lot. I learned a lot of things the hard way, unfortunately, but it's good for you guys because you don't have to learn the hard way. I can tell you that I learned the hard way that you have to say that because if you let them tell stories about being teased and bullied, they could be having a PTSD flashback and melting down kind of the way that you described or maybe one kid is okay talking about being teased and bullied, but the kid sitting next to him is having a PTSD flashback, just hearing about it. So, you know, we definitely kind of start with lots of caveats about not telling stories and not getting to all those things. And we keep a very positive, very proactive. It's very strengths-based approach. It's not a group therapy session where we're talking about what it feels like to be rejected or bullied. So really what ends up happening is there's a lot of laughter in these groups. And in fact, this is kind of interesting. Of all the sessions we teach in peers, apart from dating where there's a lot of nervous laughter, there is more laughter in the session on teasing than any other session. And I think it's because it's so empowering, right? We're teaching them to say things like, yeah, and, or your point is, and there's just so much laughter. So, you know, there's no guarantee that we're going to be able to keep the emotion out of all of these things. And, you know, and, and if that happens, we would take, let them take a little time out and collect themselves. And if they need support from one of our you know coaches, we can provide that. We try not to, to reinforce that too much. Like if you were to go out of the room every single time someone needed just a moment to collect themselves, they'd be all leaving the room constantly. So we let them try to regulate themselves as best they can. But, um, but those are some of the ways that we try to avoid kind of that, um, those emotional triggers. So thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you for the answer. I think empowerment is the key word. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for the question, Suwon. Suwon's my, my colleague here at the Department of Psychology. Yeah, she's in charge of this whole Autism Awareness Month. Wonderful, um, thank you. All right, and we've got a question from Haiyan. Um, hello, Dr. Logerson, thank you for your sharing. Do you have any advice for therapists who are working with teenagers with autism for the first time? Well, I mean, if you're working with a kid with autism for the first time as a therapist, I think you're gonna have to do your due diligence and get educated, right, about what it is to have autism and what it is to, um, well, to, to, ex to be neurodivergent, to um, what is the world like? I mean, it's, it's not something I would really recommend um, that people do if they don't have a lot of experience working with those on the spectrum because there's so many unique 
challenges and also unique strengths that, you know, I, I think it's good to get some training, but maybe, maybe there's not the option, you know, you you sort of don't have the luxury of, of that type of training. I would say, you know, get some more information and instead of just focusing on like the disability kind of perspective of things, I would also remind everybody that there's a lot of strengths um, among neurodivergent um, individuals. And so I like to focus on a lot of those strengths. I like to take a strengths-based approach in working with neurodivergent youth and think about well, what are those strengths and let's build upon them. And so, for example, um, even something like disclosing a diagnosis, you know, we teach a lot of our young people how to do that, particularly in um, employment settings or around dating, friendships. And, you know, a lot of people don't teach um, individuals how to, to share a diagnosis or disclose a, you know, condition or like that. And so people will sometimes kind of blurt that out and, and they might make it sound like it's this really you know, major challenge in their life. And it sounds so negative. And, and, and I think a lot of people have the tendency to think of neurodivergence in that way about challenges and about disability, but really there's a lot of strengths. So the reason I mentioned this is because this is kind of a good example of where knowing about um, autism would be very helpful in working with someone on the spectrum. So let's say you have a, a young person that's um, decided they want to disclose, you know, their diagnosis, for example, to an employer. They don't know how to do that. Well, you would kind of start with, you know, explaining um, the difference, right? You might have noticed, for example, that I don't make a lot of eye contact when I when I talk to to you and to you know my my fellow um, employees or coworkers. Um, and then you kind of label like why that is, right? So I, I actually am autistic. I don't know if you know much about that, but what that means for me is. And then you kind of have to explain what that means to to have autism. Um, but specific to you. But then what you want to do is you want to turn whatever you just said into a strength, right? So even though sometimes, you know, it looks like I'm not paying attention because I'm not making a lot of eye contact. In reality, I actually am really hyper-focused on what you're saying. And I might even be actually more attuned to what you're saying than maybe other people. That's a strength, right? And I actually have a pretty good memory too. So I'm probably more likely to remember um, what you, what you say. So not just focusing on some like negatives, I guess would be the, the biggest message I could say that, and, and, you know, you know, doing your homework and learning what you can about, um, about autism. But I, I just think too many people, um, approach autism from a disability model. And I just don't believe in that. I believe in more thinking about strengths-based approaches, um, so, I mean, I, I could go on and on, but that's kind of like the, the first couple things that come to mind. If, if you're new to this, this area and, and working with neurodivergent youth. And also, last thing I'll say about that is that um, there's a saying in the field of, of autism research anyway, that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism or one, one autistic person. And I mean, it's, it, what it means is that there's so much diversity across the spectrum. And so, you know, you want to get to know the person too, not just, you know, the diagnosis. Um, so thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, we've got one more question. Is that okay with you, Liz? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, this is from Thomas Go, uh, a student of mine, final year psychology student. Uh, hello, Dr. Logerson. I just wonder if the Pierce Clinic will provide interview skills training for teenagers with autism. Since the interview is quite important among social situations as well. Yeah, and Pierre, thank you for the question. Um, in Peers for Careers, we do um, lessons on interviewing skills. And, um, you know, so critical. I mean, honestly, all of our, our career coaches that are undergraduate and graduate students that are sort of, you know, helping to support our, our neurodivergent youth, they're learning a lot too. They're like, oh, wow, this is so great. I had no idea I was gonna learn so much is not that easy to know how to, to interview for, for jobs. So um, just to give you, I can't help myself. Alvin knows I love to share the skills. So just a quick snapshot of one of the things we teach in interviewing skills is I call it the, um, the elevator pitch self-statement. All right, so what is an elevator pitch? So you probably heard of an elevator pitch before, right? It's the, the time that it would take to kind of pitch something from an elevator flight from the top floor to the bottom floor. It's like one to two minutes. I mean, it's a big building, I guess, but. Anyway, so I call it an elevator pitch self-statement. So imagine you're in an interview and someone says, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. 
you know, like a lot of people, it could be like a deer in headlights. If you know that expression, like not knowing what to say, um, use an elevator pitch self-statement. Now an elevator pitch self-statement includes a me, you, us story. Okay. So what is a me, you, us story? Me is, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself about my, um, my educational background, my work experiences, my qualifications. That's the me. Then I'm going to talk about you and what I admire about this company, what I like about this position. And then I'm going to talk about why we are the perfect fit. That's the us, right? And that's what people kind of naturally do in interviews, but we just had to label it. We had to call it something that and kind of break it down. And that's an elevator pitch self-statement with a me, you, us story. So yes, um, that is one of many skills we teach related to interviewing, but a really critical skill that I think anybody could benefit from. Right. Okay. I've got a question though, Liz. I'm very curious about it, um, dating coach because it you know, got me thinking about Hitch, you know, the movie with Will Smith. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> do, they, do they have a particular training course? on how to be a dating coach. You know, I'm sure there has to be some kind of a qualification or something. Um, I think anybody, at least in the US, could just sort of call themselves a dating coach and then people uh -huh. would like, you know, sign up. But um, in our program, at least, where we have dating coaches, um, we, we do interview all of our coaches in advance, um, whether it's for the dating program or careers. And it's usually um, graduate and undergraduate students in the field of psychology or neuroscience or education. They have some kind of background in a related field. They have some interest in neurodiversity. Um, and they definitely come in with some experience, some clinical training. Um, but we train them how to be a dating coach and a career coach. They don't know these skills necessarily in advance, or maybe they have some skills, but maybe they're not the ones we're teaching and then maybe they teach it differently. So they go through the course in tandem with the young adults um, that they're paired with. The other thing that we do is we don't just sort of match them up together because we don't know who's going to be the best coach for them. So instead what we do is we do this really, really fun event. I call it speed coaching. You maybe heard of speed dating before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So it's like that. So right. speed coaching, we do it actually on a Zoom call. We've done it in person before COVID, but on a Zoom call, we basically pair each young adult up with each coach and we give them some starter questions like on the screen if they want to use them, like, you know, tell me a little bit about your educational background or what do you, what are your hobbies? You know, what do you like to do on the weekends? That kind of whatever they want to ask, they can. They have four to five minutes to interview each other. And then after that little interview, we have them rate um, privately how much they either want to coach that person or um, be coached by that person. And then we, they go and interview another person. It just goes over and over. And then we create coaching dyads based on the ratings that we get there. Mm. And, um, you know, I think it works out really well. But no, we wouldn't expect any of our coaches to really know exactly how to coach people initially. They just have to have a desire to do that, um, you know, and, and some hopefully some decent social skills to begin with. But some clinical training is good. It's not required. So I think what we're finding in our research is that you don't have to have expertise in these areas to be a good, effective coach. It's you have to be willing to learn the skills and to practice them and be supportive of this young person. I think that's really actually quite encouraging. You don't have to get a PhD yeah. to be a good dating coach. You don't have to be hitch. To yes. be a good dating coach. <laughs> well, even hitch had some hitch. Um, yes. All right. Cool. Okay. Well, um, it's 20 minutes past um, the time when we're supposed to end. Thank you so much for, for your generosity, your time, and, and of course, knowledge, and for, for sharing um, this amazing, amazing work from, from your team. Uh, I really hope that from here, we can also bring things forward, especially within the Southeast Asian region to have more of such training because we really need it. Um, yeah, so thank you again for, for PS. Um, I'm happy to um, you know, still have your book. Uh, don't have it with me now, I'm at home, it's in my office. Um, <laughs> just couldn't wake up early enough for me to go to office and have this, I'm not a morning person, so. <laughs> All right then, 
Um, well, thank you, Alvin, so much for the very, very kind invitation. Um, thank you so much to, to Sunway University and to everyone for being here. I really appreciate it and wish you the very best of luck moving forward. Thank you. All thank right. You. Um, we'll keep in touch and see what else you can do. Sounds good. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Liz. All right. Bye. Have a good day. Hope you have Thanks a good dinner. Too. Sushi, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Maybe sushi. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All Thank right. you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.